Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Azar. Um, I want to thank uh, Alicia, Alicia Pivaro, and the Architecture Foundation and the team there, Rosie especially, and um, I'm really grateful for the chance to choose um, uh, something to read uh, for this wonderful idea of bedtime stories. I had a kind of long list um, and I was rummaging through my mind and um, the one thing that stood out was you've got to go back to a classic, it's Plato's The Symposium. Um, this was a revelation. I'd always thought that uh, um, classical philosophical texts were incredibly difficult to read. This is exactly the opposite. It's an amazing um, read and it's one of the most delightful books um, and you can zoom through it. It's only 64 pages in the Penguin edition. You really can read it uh, in between when you're not doing social media. Um, I'm not going to describe too much of it. I did thought about it because it's not, um, it's been around for 2,400 years. I think a lot of people better than me have said many amazing things about it. I can only give you the insights that it created for me. Um, it's essentially about love. It's the question of eros, love, desire, and wisdom. Um, it's also the form of classical re uh, writing that I wasn't familiar with until I really got this. It's, it's a dialogue. It's a series of dialogues. It's actually the kind of Magnificent Seven uh, dialogue. It starts with... Um, a, an assembly of men. What I'm going to do, instead of rambling on, I'm going to, what I do in all bookshops when I go, I read the back page and then I read something about the author and uh, then I look at the contents page. Um, usually in that order, funnily enough. Um, so here I go. So I'll read about three or four passages out of this wonderful slim volume. Slim is always good, a new sense of lightness. Um, I'll read the back page, the front page, something about the architectural sense of this because it all happens in one room, slightly like a Hitchcock movie, uh, the rope if you know it. Um, and, that's, and then two bits of text by Aristophanes and Socrates, the great man himself. Plato doesn't appear in the book. He is, is, he writes an account of this meeting. So, here we go. In the course of a lively drinking party, a group of Athenian intellectuals exchange views on eros, or desire. From their conversation emerges a series of subtle reflections on gender roles, sex in society, and the sublimation of basic human instincts. Discussion culminates in a radical change to conventional views by Plato's mentor, Socrates, who advocates transcendence through spiritual love. The symposium is a deft interweaving of different viewpoints and ideas about the nature of love as a response to beauty, a cosmic force, a motive for social action, and, a, and as a means of ethical education. It's a hell of a summary and I love it. Um, the author uh, who's updated this a particular edition, uh, Christopher John Gill, uh, writes this, um, and it's only a short, and I'll get to the beef um, in a sh short while. Plato, 427 to 347 BC. It is 2,400 years ago or so stands with Socrates and Aristotle as one of the founders of the Western intellectual tradition. He came from a family that had long played a prominent part in Athenian politics, and it would have been natural for him to follow the same course. He declined to do so, however. He was disgusted by the violence and corruption of Athenian political life and sickened especially by the execution in 399 of his friend and teacher Socrates. Inspired by Socrates' uh, inquiries into the nature of ethical standards, Plato sought a cure for the ills of society, not in politics, but in philosophy, and arrived at the conclusion that those ills would not cease 
until philosophers became rulers or rulers philosophers. At an uncertain date in the early 4th century BC, he founded in Athens the Academy, the first permanent institution devoted to philosophical research and teaching and the prototype of all Western universities. He travelled extensively, notably to Sicily, as political advisor to Dionysius II, ruler of Syracuse. Plato wrote over 20 philosophical dialogues, and there are also extant under his name 13 letters, whose genuineness is keenly disputed. His literary activity extended over perhaps half a century. Few other writers have exploited so effectively the grace, precision, flexibility, and power of Greek prose. So this, this wonderfully thin volume, most of it's um, introduction and notes at the end, because it's, although a very slim volume in itself, um, deserves how it can be discussed. So if you remember, the symposium is basically a drinking party or a dinner party, but not as we know it. Um, not as we know it generally. Uh, there is a theme, and I think the setting of it is the most important thing. So it's held in a room. So the Andron was a square room with a raised floor on all sides, on, on, on which were arranged typically between seven and eleven couches. Guests reclined on the couches, usually two to a couch, leaning on cushions with their left elbows, leaving their right hands free to eat and drink from low tables in front of them. The couches formed a square, broken by the door, obviously. The first position, which is in front of the door, seems to have been moved fa uh, most favoured, perhaps at the first to be served and the last least so. This arrangement promoted reciprocal conversation or song around and across the square. Wine and taking turns in song or speech went round the room, usually from left to right. The windowless room often had wall paintings. The scenes like those on the decorated mixing bowl and cups might be those of symposia or erotic encounters. The whole context created a sealed and privileged space in which the attention of the guests was focused on each other and on their shared enjoyment of wine, talk, music and sensuality. Erotic company was provided by female courtesans and sometimes their male equivalents who served as musical entertainers and escorts. Their erotic role at the symposium seems to have been more or less explicit for flirtation rather than sexual intercourse which might have occurred later. So it really is bedtime reading uh, some of this stuff. Um, as I said there is seven dialogues which I put forward and I think I've made some notes here. The profession of um, each of these guests, rather than try and pronounce their names and make mistakes, um, there's an aristocrat, there's a legal chap, um, there's a, 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 a doctor, um, there's a writer, a comic writer, that's Aristophanes, which I am going to read. And there's a poet, um, a philosopher, and a statesman. So it's a pretty amazing lineup. And they all take in turns to make an account of the discussion of Eros desire. Um, so to jump to Aristophanes, who was the invited guest who represents the um, comic writer. He starts at page 22 or so. Um, and I'm not going to start from where he properly starts because there's a lot of chit chat in between each person which sort of lines people up. So here's Aristophanes. I think people have fo wholly failed to recognise the power of love. If they'd grasped this, they'd have built the greatest temples and altars for him and made the greatest sacrifices. In fact, none of this is done for him, though he deserves it most of all. He loves human beings more than any other god. He is their helper and the doctor of those sicknesses 
whose cure constitutes the greatest happiness for the human race. I shall try to explain his power to you and you will teach this to others. Pretty confident Aristophanes, obviously. First of all, you must learn about human nature and what has happened to it. Long ago, our nature was not the same as it is now, but quite different. For one thing, there were three human genders, not just the present two, male and female. There was also a third gender, uh, a combination of these two. Now its name survives, although the gender has vanished. Then androgynous was a distinct gender, as well as a name, combining male and female. Now nothing is left but the name, which is used as an insult. For another thing, and this is where it gets really interesting, the shape of each human being was a rounded hole with back and sides forming a circle. Each one had four hands and the same number of legs and two identical faces on a circular neck. They had one head for both the faces, which were turned to opposite directions. Four ears, two sets of genitals, and everything else was as you would imagine from what I've said so far. They moved around upright, as we do now, in, in either direction, as they wanted. When they set off to run fast, they supported themselves on their eight limbs and moved quickly round and round like tumblers who do cartwheels by keeping their legs straight as they go round and round. The reason why, they, why there were three genders and why they were as described is that the parent of the male gender was originally the sun, that of the female gender, the earth, that of the combined gender, the moon, because the moon is a combination of sun and earth. I love that imagery because the moon is so important. They were round and so was the way they moved because they took after their parents. They were terrible in their strength and vigour. They had great ambitions and made an attack on the gods. The story told by Homer about Aphialates and Otis, how they tried to climb up to heaven to attack the gods, really refers to them. Zeus and the other gods discussed what to do with them and couldn't decide. The gods didn't see how they could kill them, wiping out the human race with, with thunderbolts, as they'd done with the giants. If they did that, the honours and sacrifices the gods received from them would disappear. But they couldn't let them go on behaving outrageously. After much hard thought, Zeus, Zeus had an idea. I think I have a plan by which human beings could still exist but be too weak to carry on their wild behaviour. I shall now cut each of them into two. They will be weaker and also more useful to us because there will be more of them. They will walk around, and up, uh, around upright on two legs. If we think they're still acting outrageously and they won't settle down, I'll cut them in half again so that they move around hopping on one leg. After saying this, Zeus cut humans into two. As people cut Zorb apples in half before they preserve them, or as they cut hard-boiled eggs with hairs. As he cut each one, he told Apollo to turn the face and the half to touch to it towards the gash, so that humans would see their own wound and be more orderly. Zeus also told him to heal the other wounds. There's a bit of a description on, on, on how this all works, but then it's... Uh, Apollo turned round the face, he pulled the skin from all around the body, towards what's now called the stomach, like a purse being pulled tight uh, with a drawstring and finished it off by making one opening in the middle of the stomach, which we'll, we will call the navel. He also smoothed off the other numerous wrinkles, etc., etc. So, Aristophanes continues, since their original nature had been cut into two, each one longed for its own other half and stayed with it. They, th they threw their own arms around each other weaving themselves together, wanting to form a single living thing. So they die from hunger and from general inactivity because they didn't want to do anything apart from each other. When one of the halves died and one was left, the one that was left looked for another and wove itself together with that. Sometimes the one it met was half of a whole woman, the half we now call a woman, sometimes half a whole man. In any case, they kept on dying in this way. I'll skip a little bit and move on. There's a chapter about Zeus, how he took pity on them. But 
That's how, long ago, the innate desire of human beings for each other started. So love becomes desire in a way, because it's a longing. It draws the two halves of our original nature back together and tries to make one out of two and to heal the wound in human nature. Each of us is a matching half of a human being because we've been cut in half like flatfish, making two out of one and each of us looking for his own matching half. And that's really where I'm going to stop. He does continue, but um, when I read this, Apart from its kind of visual poetry, it, um, just before that, I'd uh, finished my first year at the Royal Academy of Arts in Piccadilly, and then I was in Pakistan in Lahore for a year working for Kamal Khan Mumtaz, and I was reading R.D. Lang, The Divided Self. Um, Langian theory about human beings is poetic as well, and the divided self and this longing to find the other sort of resonates all through that for me. But the great thing about a wonderful book that's 2,400 years old, you can find your own way through it. Um, I'm just gonna, not sure how much time I've got left actually, but uh, I don't have to look at my 15 minutes or so. Mm, better sort of keep it at a nice pace. Um, before I start with the next piece, um, I just want to um, credit the person that actually gave me this book. It was a reward for moving their apartment um, from South London to their new apartment in North London. And it was a, a wonderful young, uh, I went when we were postgraduates of the apartment, it's a new Erasmus student, um, Matthias from Darmstadt. I think Matthias Lerman, there you go. And, my reward was this very thin volume. I never appreciated it when he handed it to me. And it was a, a few weeks later, I lazily picked it up and couldn't put it down. And rewards like a present like this are so, so valuable. So quite a few times I have given this to people I love. But recently I've rediscovered it. So thank you, Alicia. So, the remarkable, remarkable Socrates, the man that Plato loved and adored and worshipped and was heartbroken when he was executed. Um, uh, he, Socrates does something remarkable. He's not like the other sex. He doesn't talk through his own voice. Uh, he talks through a woman's voice, uh, a, an extraordinary woman, and I'm going to start with that. So he teases the host, and um, whilst he's finished doing that, uh, because he's extremely bright and clever, he starts. Now I'll let you go, speaking to the host. I'll try to restate for you the account of love that I once heard from a woman from Mantinea called Diotima. She was wise about this and many other things. On one occasion, she enabled the Athenians to delay the plague for 10 years by, by telling them what sacrifices to make. Don't really want to talk about plagues at the moment, but there you go. She is also the one who taught me the ways of love. I'll report what she said, using as a basis the conclusions I reached with Agathon, but doing it on my own as far as I can. Okay, Agathon is the host. As you stated, Agathon, one should first describe who love is and what his character is and then describe his effects. I think the easiest thing is to report the uh, content of a discussion I once had with Diotima in which she put questions to me. I'd said to her virtually the same things that Agathon had said to me just now, that love was a great God and that he was himself beautiful. She used against me the same arguments that I used against him proving that, according to my reasoning, love was neither beautiful nor good. I said, what do you mean, Diotima? Is love ugly and bad then? She said, what blasphemy? Do you think that anything which isn't beautiful must necessarily be ugly? I certainly do, saying Socrates. 
and must anything that isn't uh, wise be ignorant? Haven't you realized that there's something between wisdom and ignorance? What is it? It's having right opinions without being able to give reasons for having them. Don't you realize that this isn't knowing because you don't have knowledge unless you can give reasons? But it isn't ignorance either because ignorance has no contact with the truth. Right opinion, of course, has this kind of status falling between understanding and ignorance. You're right, I said, Socrates said. Then don't, then don't think that what isn't beautiful must be ugly and that, wasn't, that what isn't good must be bad. In the same way, when you, you yourself agree that love is neither good nor beautiful, don't suppose that he must therefore be ugly and bad, but something in between these two. But I said, it's agreed by everyone that love is a great God. Do you mean everyone who doesn't know? She asked, or do you also include those who do? This is where I slightly do get into a spin, because I can read it again. But absolutely everyone, Socrates said. She laughed and said, but Socrates, how could people agree that love is a great God if they deny he's a God at all? Who are these people, I said. You're one, she said, and I'm another. At this I demanded, how can you say this? Easily, she said, tell me, do you think that all gods are happy and beautiful? Or would you dare to suggest that any of the gods is beautiful and, and, and is not beautiful and happy? By his use, I wouldn't, said Socrates. And you call happy those who are in possession of good and beautiful things? Certainly, but you've agreed that it's because love is in need of good and beautiful things that he desires those very things that he needs. Yes, I've agreed to that, said Socrates. So how could he be a god if he's not in possession of beautiful and good things? That's impossible, as, as it seems. Do you see then, she said, that you don't believe love is a god? But what could love be, I said? A mortal? Far from it. What then? Like those in examples discussed earlier? He's between mortal and immortal. What does that make him, Diotima? He is a great spirit, Socrates. Everything classed as a spirit falls between God and human. This is where it gets interesting. What function do they have? They interpret and carry messages from humans to gods and from gods to humans. They convey prayers and sacrifices from humans and commands and gifts in return for sacrifices from gods. Being intermediate between the other two, they fill the gap between them and enable the universe to form an interconnected whole. They serve as the medium for all divination, for priestly expertise and sacrifice, ritual and spells, and for all prophecy and sorcery. Gods do not make direct contact with humans. They communicate and converse with humans, whether awake or asleep, entirely through the medium of spirits. Someone whose wisdom lies in these areas is a man of a spirit, while wisdom in other areas of expertise and craftsmanship makes one merely a mechanic. There are many spirits of very different kinds, and one, one of them is love. So I think that's kind of Diotima's setup to really go for what she's getting to. And Socrates asks the question, and um, in classical times, I think, it, I think it has more than the apparent meaning. So the question is, who are his, being love, who are his father and mother, Socrates asks. That's rather a long story, and I'm going to try and keep it short, so don't panic. Um, that's rather a long story, she replied, but I'll tell you anyway. Following the birth of Aphrodite, the other gods were having a feast, including resource, the son of invention, and I didn't know that, so resources, having a good time at the feast. When they've had dinner, poverty came to beg, as people do at feasts, and so she was by the gate. Resource was drunk with nectar. This was before wine was discovered. And Resource went to the garden of geese and fell into a drunken sleep. Poverty formed the plan of relieving her lack of resources by having a child by resource. She slept with him and became pregnant with love. So the reason love became a follower and attendant of Aphrodite is because he was conceived on the day of her birth. 
Also, he's naturally a lover of beauty and Aphrodite is beautiful. So, Aphrodite, resource and poverty. Resource and poverty, uh, um, poverty is pregnant with love from resource. Because he is the son of resource and poverty, love's situation is like this. First of all, he's always poor. Far from being sensitive and beautiful as he is commonly supposed, he's tough, with hardened skin, without shoes or home. He always sleeps rough on the ground with no bed, lying in doorways and by roads in the open air, sharing his mother's nature. He always lives in a state of need. On the other hand, take, uh, taking after his father, he schemes to get hold of beautiful and good things. He's brave, impetuous and intense, a formidable hunter. He's always weaving tricks. He desires knowledge and is resourceful in getting it. A lifelong lover of wisdom. Clever at using magic, drugs and sophistry. That's a pretty good set of skills, I think. Um, by nature, he is neither immortal nor mortal. Sometimes on a single day, he shoots into life when he's successful and then dies. And then taking after his father, comes back to life again his resourceful father. The resources he obtains keeps on draining away so that love is neither holy without resources nor rich. He is also in between wisdom and ignorance. The position is this. None of the gods loves wisdom or has the desire to become wise because they already are. Nor does anyone else who is already wise love wisdom. Nor do the ignorant, ignorant love wisdom or have the desire to become wise. The problem with ignorant person is precisely that. Despite not being good or intelligent, he regards himself as satisfactory. I met a few of those. If someone doesn't think he's in need of something, he can't desire what he doesn't think he needs. Who are the lovers of wisdom, Diotima? Socrates asks. If they are neither the wise nor the ignorant. Even a child, Diotima says, would realise by now that it is those who fall between these two and that love is one of them. Wisdom is, is one of the most beautiful things and love is love of beauty. So love must necessarily be a lover of wisdom and, be a, and as a lover of wisdom, he falls between wisdom and ignorance. Again, the reason for this is his own origin. His father is wise and resourceful while his mother has neither quality. So this is the nature of the spirit of love, my dear Socrates. But it's not at all, not at all surprising that you took the view of love you, uh, that you did. To judge from what you said, I think you saw love as the object of love instead of the lover. That's why you imagine that love is totally beautiful. But in fact, beauty, elegance, perfection and blessedness are char characteristic of the object that deserves to be loved, while the lover has a quite different character which I have described. That hits you. Well, Diotima, Socrates says, I'm sure you're right about this, but if love is like that, what use is he to human beings? Um, I'm going to stop there because there's another few pages of this amazing dialogue and then there's the final speaker comes into play. And that's a, an incredible account. Um, so, just to dwell upon this for a moment, I want to say thank you very, very much for uh, joining me in remembering a brilliant, um, uh, a brilliant book. And I really want to thank uh, the love of my life, Anna, who's behind the camera, and, and all the other people that I dearly, dearly miss and love. Um, and of course, I dedicate this to uh, to the, the the people that I love, the small people I love, um, uh, my two little boys, Alexander Zane and Antonio Saran, and all my family, my mother and my father, who are both resourceful and poor in their own ways. Um, please do read it. It's a brilliant book. It'll take you a short amount of time. I send you best wishes and greetings and stay well and be a lover.